Page number eight. Number eight. Page 24. Come, let us see. 
later, and it's like, oh my gosh, the Lord knew all along that I was going to come to a personal relationship with him. So I'm going to read from uh, Psalms 139, starting at verse 13. The Lord says, you, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And so I just want to offer a prayer for, for this little boy that's going to be uh, raised among us and will have the joy of seeing him grow as we've had the joy of seeing they only grow. Uh, there's just something so special about babies. It just, it just brings tears to my eyes. And then we have all these um, older children and how precious they are for the Lord. And um, we just pray um, for the Lord to direct their lives all the days of their life. And he will do that. So I'm going to pray, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of little Asher, and we just pray your blessing upon um, Abby as she recovers, Lord, and we just ask you to uh, guide and direct, give them uh, courage, uh, wisdom, and strength, Lord, as they move forward with their family. I pray for Arlen also, Lord, that you <clears throat> just work in his heart and show him, Lord, for the what the work it is you want him to do here. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And now, uh, uh, the communion, uh, we are going to, uh, let's see, I'm going to uh, bring the hands <coughs> where the Lord's Supper was instituted.
Well then let's bring out these kids. These kids are awesome. They are absolutely, I don't have to tell anybody in this room this, but they are future of the kingdom. And uh, not only not only are they the future of the kingdom, but they have the they have the, the uh, presence and the influence right now as they are to influence people for the kingdom. I've seen it happen with my very own eyes. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for these kids. Thank you for the arrows that um, that you blessed us with in our quiver, Lord, and in your quiver that undoubtedly will uh, further your kingdom from now until forever. But I thank you for them. I ask that you would please bless them. I ask that you would please bless the teaching this morning. Let it resonate with them. Let it sink into their little hearts. And uh, I'll just be with you this morning. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, here I was afraid of having to do this in front of a whole bunch of people. <laughs> Maybe afraid is the wrong word. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, so good morning again. Uh, today is going to be the second in the I'm Not a Preacher series. It may come as a surprise to some of you that there was a first in the I'm Not a Preacher series. It, it has been some time ago. Uh, if you'd like a copy of my sermon notes, just let me know. I'd be happy to happy to uh, provide them. I have them. I have them filed away carefully in paper towel. Two bubblegum wrappers and a popsicle stick. And though I'm uh, I'm using this this uh, title somewhat in jest, God's been showing me the real the real um, weight of this statement. When I say I'm not a preacher, it's uh, it shows that in our weakness, He's made strong. Thank God for that. Right? That we don't have to do it all. So bear with me as I stand here and demonstrate God being made strong. 
He's also revealed to me that I need to add a word to that title. Because the truth is that by definition, it turns out that I am, after all, a preacher. And so are you. See, according to Webster, to preach, of course, has several very definitions. But one of them is to give moral or religious instruction. And follower is roughly defined as someone who follows, who obeys the commands of the person whom they are following. Okay, so what sort of commands did the person who we call ourselves followers of, what sort of commands did he give us? He said to love God and to love people. In Matthew 28, 16, he told us to go and make disciples of all nations. That sounds somewhat familiar, should. It sounds a little to me like uh, giving moral or religious instruction. So, if you're sitting out there and you're a follower of Christ, or if you're listening, you're a follower of Christ, congratulations. You just joined me in the ranks of the newly titled preachers. Your uh, preacher starter kit should be in the mail before you know it. So instead, the word that I need to add to this title is great. I'm not a great preacher. But how do we determine if something is great or if it's so-so or if it's altogether bad? We have to have something to compare it to. I'm not a great preacher compared to Billy Graham. Not a great preacher compared to Arlen Bridian. I'm not a great preacher compared to pretty much all the preachers that, that I could list on a, on a sheet or that you could list. Much like my last message in this series, long, long ago, as I think about what God's led me to write down here, it's pretty clearly a message He's given me to preach to myself. So, I hope that doesn't come off too selfish. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And hopefully you'll get some sort of collateral benefit out of it and, and not just collateral damage. Uh, but before I get too far mired down up here, does anybody of this massive throng have any uh, testimonies or prayer requests that we can start out with? Let's hear it. We uh, at Bible study on Thursday. We had uh, some people, a couple of gals there that had been there prior. Oh, they had been there one time prior. And it was our last Bible study of the series. And we welcomed a new baby in the Christian family in our community. And it's, uh, it's Eileen Carson. So I would ask you all to keep Eileen Carson in your prayers. She had, something missing in his life. 
for a long time. He's not happy with who he is with himself, you know. And uh, and while observing this, he has another counselor in his life who's not a believer, right? And this this individual is telling him, do what will it, do you need to do what's going to make you happy, you know? So he has this huge life decision, which involves does he stay in Boise or go with his brother to the middle town to like the Coral Lane sand point. And, uh, and and so he's feeling like you know, this missing part has something to do with not having his own independence and not having his own place and all these outside external circumstances, right? And the things to do with his position in life right now, etc. And so he gave me a great opportunity to say, hey Brian, I, I think that you know this is a classic case of the grass growing green on the other side. Do you think if you take this certain course of action, change your circumstances or your position or whatever, it's going to make you happy with home because happiness comes from within, it comes from having a right relationship with God, getting the joy and the contentment from Him and understanding who you are in Christ, it gives you a joy and a happiness that can withstand any trial, any difficulty, any circumstance in life. And that's what you that's what you mean. That's the void that's not filled. It's, it's not, you know, going this path or that path. What happened? I mean, I got kind of harsh with him a little bit because I feel like I'm close enough with him that I can do this. But I was like, when I hear from him all this unthankfulness and, and, and lack of gratitude for what God has done in your life, you're an incredibly best person. You know, you have you live, you live in a four thousand square foot house with his brother. And Plays pickleball in those afternoons. He's just incredibly blessed, you know? But, and it's a great example of what was that, Matthew, Matthew, uh, or Mark, uh, Matthew 16, somewhere in there, this is a really proper man who gains the whole world and loses his soul. Well, a man can exchange for his soul, you know, money, rich, health, whatever sort of thing. And, and the world comes along and, and, and I see it. Like, it, this, this, this friend of his, not a believer, who's preaching this, just make yourself happy. Pursue the things that the materialistic things, pursue whatever, and and uh, and it's such a big lie, you know. And I was like, maybe if you just wake up every day and write down a list of the things you're thankful for and you're grateful for, maybe that'll help you change that perspective, you know, and start to realize how blessed you are. And, and I think that's the solution to, to to come to Christ, to throw yourself before Him and His Father, and recognize that that's what. Being a true Christian actually is because he's claiming to be a Christian. You know, it's funny because they always say to me, like, I'm not a spiritual or like a Christian like you are. You know, and I kind of always say, you know, you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. There's not degrees of kind of being closer. But anyway, like, throw yourself before Christ in desperation and say, I'm not worried about anything. I don't deserve anything. That's what we can say today. It's coming in complete, absolute you know, surrender. And he comes in and he fills that void for you. So I tell you, like, praise and all of that. The opportunity came and really to share all that with him. And then just a prayer that, that as I continue to, to have these kinds of conversations with him and love him, that maybe God will work to, to bring him to the place where he actually, I think, actually is truly understands the, the gospel and repents and surrenders to Christ and be saved and experiences that. The joy that we all who are in Christ have. And so I have another one that's just against the crowd of Sorry, I don't know if you want to play it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here right now. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I really appreciate that, that prayer for me. Brian Reeves is his name. Absolutely. We'll keep, definitely keep Brian in prayer. I like Brian. Brian's a cool guy. I wouldn't keep him in prayer even if I didn't like him, but. <laughs> but it helps. Anybody have any other prayer requests? All right, then. Father God, thank you for this day. Um, Lord, I thank you for the things that you're doing in our community, both in our in our local, close community. I thank you for the new baby believer uh, that just came to came to faith in you recently. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, surround her with people who would encourage her and and give her the uh, motivation and the guidance to stay. To get and to stay rooted and grounded in you, Father. 
and that you would just protect her against the inevitable um, attacks of the enemy, or just keep her covered. Keep her covered with your wings, Father. Lord, we also lift up Brian, and I thank you. I thank you for uh, for uh, Brian himself, Lord. I thank you that that in his in his going through life, that you are uh, showing to him that he's becoming more aware of the God-shaped hole inside of his life. And I pray that you would just reveal that to him, that it's not the stuff and that it's not the accomplishments and it's not the, uh, all the other surrounding stuff that, it, that is going to fill that hole. Um, Father, just direct him, guide him uh, straight to you so that he can fill that God-shaped hole and have, have true peace, joy that comes only from you. I thank you for Justin's friendship with him, and I thank you for the, the uh, ministry that he has there. And uh, I pray that you would please just bless that, Father. Lord, I ask that you would please bless the scribblings that I've got written down here, Lord. I pray that I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to uh, to deliver a message to your people. I pray that you would cause any hollow or idle words to to just fall to the floor. Lord, I pray that the things that are worthwhile, Lord, the things that are of you uh, would be would be heard loud and clear. Lord, I can't do it by myself. I need your help. So please guide my, guide my thoughts, guide my words. And we ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. So... One of the things that Sarah and I have tried to consistently teach our boys is that in general, as a result of our sin nature, comparing only does one thing. And if they were sitting over there right now and I asked, what does comparing do? They would both tell you, maybe in unison, maybe off key, but they would both tell you that comparing Steals your joy. Now I'd like you to think about this for just a moment and see the truth in it. If I give thing one a scoop of ice cream, joy abounds. But if I then give thing two a scoop and a half of ice cream, or a scoop plus three molecules of ice cream, Comparison then ensues, and suddenly that one scoop of ice cream isn't nearly as joyful. How does that work? It just does. Another example that I thought of is my zombie jeep. I love my zombie jeep. I really like my zombie jeep. I mean, it's, it's kind of old. You know, the headliner's gone, the windshield's cracked. It makes some funny smells once in a while. But all in all, I'm pleased with my zombie jeep. It's reliable. It always starts. It pretty much goes wherever I point it to. It has a heater. And it has not a fancy paint job, so it doesn't really matter if I get a little bit of reservation pinstriping on it while I'm out bushwhacking somewhere. No big deal. It's cool. Love my zombie jeep. But now let's consider the day that Ben and Becky parked their Jeep next to my Jeep. It hasn't happened yet, but I dread the day. <laughs> okay, I don't really, Ben, in case you watch this later. And they're not even here to defend themselves, so. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> but let's look, at the, let's look at the potential for dissatisfaction when Ben and Becky parked next to my Jeep or vice versa, vice, vice, uh, you know what I mean, vice versa. And I look over and I see that their Jeep has a headliner. And the window's not cracked. And I like the color a little bit better than mine. And it's a few years newer than mine. Man, how quickly my joy evaporated from something that I'm pleased with to something that I start to see all the, all the warts with. Now, with that framework, it's pretty easy, I think, to plug and play with all of the, all of the physical stuff. 
you know? Real easy to, real easy to see that. You can, you can replace that with the houses or spouses or even our own physical traits, you know? I felt pretty good about being five foot nine and a half, and then I stand next to Arlo and go, man, I wish I was six feet tall and handsome like that. Now, how's about in our relationships? I think pretty highly of my marriage. Then sometimes I get around a couple who has the same taste in kitchen tile and love all the same seasons and you seem to work so well together in everything they do. And one that I really struggle with, and this is this is Betty, and I'm, and I'm kind of burying my my insights here, so don't throw things at me. At one point years ago, I was doing what I deem to be a large share of the hand washing of the dishes in our house. It wasn't, it wasn't that the workload was unevenly divided. It's just that that's how it worked out that I needed to do much of the hand washing. It also happened that usually the time that was available to do that was after dinner. After the crying baby had gone to sleep and my wife had also gone to bed. Because that makes sense. Sleep when the baby sleeps, right? With, with Sarah watching Cougar bait, uh, she's been reminded of that, that go sleep when the baby sleeps. Okay, so that makes sense. I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. But it just so worked out that there I was at 10 o'clock at night, barefoot in the kitchen, washing dishes like Cinderella. And I started grumbling inside, man, I'll bet you way back in the Good old days. I bet you my grandpa was never found washing dishes while his wife was in there sleeping. Well, whether he did or whether he did not, I'll never know. I have my suspicions, but I'll never know for sure. But really, it's all immaterial. This was an arrangement that my wife and I had made willingly. And it only, it only got ugly when I started comparing my, my spot with somebody else's imagined spot that I, was, I don't even really know if it was really a thing. It was just how I, how I concocted it. Did I mention I'm preaching this message to myself? <laughs> I, I know that habitually comparing things is a condition that's not necessarily helpful or even healthy. And thankfully, it's a condition that Jesus can change within us and he is doing a work inside me. So, sneakily though, I think that's a word, it's gonna be a word now anyway, sneakily. The other side of that is a thing too. When you see somebody else's thing, physical thing or relationship or, or station in life or whatever it is, when you see somebody else's thing that yours is better than in some sense, if you're not careful, that can really quickly go from, uh, go from joy in the thing that you're pleased with to pride. If we're not careful, it'll get there real quick. Hey, man, like, like maybe as I've buried some of my own struggles, maybe you're sitting out there going, man, that guy's a mess. I'm glad I'm not like that. There is, of course, the beneficial side of comparing. I did say in general, comparing steals your joy. The beneficial side is, is something such as looking up to someone and, and aspiring to be a better whatever. If I was a rookie piano player and I sit and watch Abby play the piano, if I compare myself and I go, you know, I want to be, I want to be like that. So I, I set myself to it and I, I, I determined to practice and to study and to do all the things that it takes to get from where I am to, to that 
higher ability or whatever it is, then comparing can actually be a good thing. But I don't know about you, that's not where my sin nature defaults to. I wish it was. Maybe someday. So, after all of that, let's get into some scripture for today's message to illuminate a couple of beneficial comparisons that I'd like to make. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And we're going to take a look at Paul. You know, the Paul. Paul who's been credited with doing more to spread the gospel than perhaps any other human who wasn't the Son of God. Paul. I'm not a great preacher compared to Paul. Ooh. How does your preaching stack up to Paul? Let's take a look. For some context, I'm actually going to start in chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1, verse 26. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, just in case it reads a little bit differently than what you have. I really like the way that this, uh, that this puts it. So, verse 26, Paul said, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. I'll wear that. That's okay. I don't mind being foolish to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. I had to read over that, that line a couple of times, and it's, I think that it would be easy, maybe I'm the only one, maybe it would be easy to read that a couple of different ways, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. It's not so that no, so that in the, Mm, let me recapture my thought. It doesn't say so that no human being can boast about the presence of God, or that no human being can boast of the presence of God. It is that in the presence of God, no human can boast, which is why God chooses the foolish to, to uh, shame the strong, etc. Verse 30, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And now on to chapter 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There's a couple of main things that I'd like to like to point out here. In verse 1, Paul points out that he didn't come with lofty speech or wisdom. <laughs> I guess maybe I'm in good company. Maybe that means I'm off the hook to stand up here and try to be lofty and wise. Paul didn't come preaching a complicated, academically acclaimed message that dazzled people to Jesus by his amazing sermon composition and oration. Simply Jesus Christ and him crucified. In verse 2, in fact, uh, if we look at uh, verse 3, rather, we can see a description that would pretty handily fit most of us standing up here to preach. I'll read it again. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. 
and my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Hmm. And if we turn to uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 10, we get a view of how Paul was seen by others. This is this guy. 2 Corinthians 10, 10. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. <laughs> Paul wrote that. He knew that. He knew that that's what others thought of him. That his, uh, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. So, as I read these things, it's like, gosh, I guess, I guess maybe in, in these comparisons we can, I mean, this is Paul. This is Paul who did so much, I mean, end to the earth kind of stuff. To, to further the message. And Paul was somebody who, if he had a pulpit to stand up behind, I don't know if he did or not, but if he was standing behind a pulpit, his knees would be knocking and he'd be uh, afraid and trembling and nervous. This is Paul. How did Paul present, prevent that comparison from silencing him, or from, from keeping him from doing what he did. He simply made his comparison against the cornerstone, against the stone that the builders rejected. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, don't get me wrong. For those of you who are more learned than myself, that includes most everybody in this room, I'm not now playing at all, being uh, studied and being wise about everything that's in here. What I am simply saying is that I lost my spot in my notes. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2 15, you know, it says that we're to study to show, your, to show yourself approved. In 1 Peter 3.15, we'll always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. So, so I, I don't mean to oversimplify it. I don't know about you, but I'll ask rhetorically, have you ever avoided a conversation or avoided a topic in a conversation because you thought yourself ill-prepared? that you didn't have all the answers for somebody? I've been there. I have numerous conversations that ring in my head that I avoided talking about Jesus because I knew the person that I was talking to was a real intellect and was going to grill me and I didn't have all the answers. But what I mean is that not being a theological scholar does not disqualify one from preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Compare your ministry only to what Jesus commanded you to do. To love God, to love people, to go and make disciples of all nations preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And it went a little bit quicker than I had time to when I practiced this message. But that's, that's the message. That's the, um, that's the point that I wanted to make because I often have that, have that tendency to go, gosh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not that trained or I'm not that smart to, to be able to, to preach. Jesus Christ was crucified for you and he was crucified for me so that we could have eternal life through him.
Amen. The scripture in First Peter. It's First Peter three fifteen. Had it marked. No, I lost it. Mark. So, because of an absence of words right now, I'm going to do the best thing I know how to do, and we're going to pray again. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for these people that are your people. Thank you for this body of believers that we enjoy uh, to have to have encouragement and to have fellowship with. Lord, I pray that you would um, encourage each of us. Lord, I ask that you would give us boldness so that we would not shrink away from conversations or, or that we would not shrink away from uh, parts of conversations, that we would boldly proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified. I pray that you would go with us as we head out into a new week. I ask for your blessings over us, and I ask for your safety uh, to go along with us. We thank you, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Children have probably watched for at least a few more minutes, so... Now's the time to go take a nap or run.